Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey, hey, what's happening, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Berkelhammer. So, on tonight's live stream, I welcome back Bobby Miller, also known as Humble Fish. What's happening there, Bobby? Hi, Keith. Uh, I'm doing great. How are you today? Excellent, man. And uh, you uh, you are doing this uh, live stream from Florida, you tell me there, huh? Yep. We're in Panama City Beach, Florida. My wife and I are, uh, we've been di digital nomads for the last three years, and we just kind of travel around the country now and stay, you know, in one place for a month or two. And then we were in Vermont uh, last July, you know, I think close to where you are, and uh, we just kind of travel all over the country. That's pretty cool, man. That you can that you that you can do that, and um, yeah, it's a great way to see the uh, the country and figure out exactly where you want to end up. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So, just a little background on Bobby for those that don't know him. He has been in the saltwater aquarium hobby since 1978, and being in the hobby for so long has provided him the opportunity to keep just about every type of marine system possible. In addition, Bobby has worked in retail maintenance and most recently owned and operated humble fish aquatics which sold quarantined conditioned saltwater fish uh around 16 years ago is it 16 years ago bobby you decided to devote yourself to the fish and disease treatment aspect of the hobby yes and around 2008 2008 and so that's considered your uh, your area of expertise he also owns and operates humble.fish and Reef Community, an aquarium forum which is dedicated to helping fellow hobbyists. But before we start chatting with Bobby, I want to thank the sponsors for this live stream, both Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. I really appreciate them supporting the show, and I also appreciate all you folks out there tuning in. I see there's a bunch of you already on the live stream. As per usual, please drop your questions or comments in the chat. We'll uh, do our best to get to everything. And... Um, yeah, so so Bobby, I think we what uh, the the main focus of the discussion tonight is to talk about um, disease identification and treatments for fish. So uh, there are some other topics though that I wanted to hit with you before we got into the nitty 
gritty of that discussion. And, and people, yeah, please, um, if you wanted to ask a question before we kind of got into that um, detailed dis discussion about specific diseases and treatments, then do it. Um, so, you know, I was, um, I was on your uh, forum recently, Bobby, and um, I see that there's always a lot of mention of Hubble Fish approved vendors you know, that you feel it's okay to buy fish from. Can you just explain the uh, the criteria behind that, you know, and how, how folks, both uh, local fish stores and online retailers can get on that list? So we have both uh, dry goods vendors and livestock vendors. So um, I'll just start with the livestock vendors. So livestock vendors are kind of broken down into quarantine vendors and just non-quarantine vendors. Um, quarantine vendors are, are vendors that sell if they're selling fish, they're quarantine conditioned fish. Um, we do have like, um, we have one vendor that just specializes in selling um, corals because, you know, corals carry pests and actually can um, be, um, have, you know, like fit, like it can velvet tomos on it so they can harbor, you know, um, fish parasites as well. So ah, really? those, yeah. I didn't realize. So yeah. you could actually transfer fish disease via coral. Yeah. So, hmm. so for example, getting off on a segue here, but so like it can velvet, for instance, have, um, have a tomont stage when the parasites drop off the fish, it they're, they're called protomonts. They crawl around and they look for a hard, um, like a hard surface to insist to. Well, if it happens to be a, a snail shell or like a frag plug or like, you know, like LPS, you know how they have like the hard stony base, they can actually insist to that. And that's basically like the tomo or the egg stage, which then releases uh, free swimmers into the water, which mm. will, you know, infect your fish. So we, we in addition to just, uh, you know, vendors that quarantine and condition the fish, we also have vendors. Now we have a, uh, a new one that just started called Inverted Reef, and they specialize in doing nothing but selling uh, cleanup crew, uh, uh, shrimp, crabs, you know, inverts, you know, Inverted Reef. Um, we have another one, Terra Reef. He specializes in um, selling uh, quarantine condition corals. So those are all of the the, the quarantine vendors that are on um, the forum, and I vet them personally. Um, you know, we 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 communicate a lot. We kind of work. We collaborate. We work together. And basically, it comes down to vendors that I feel are doing because look, everybody and their brother nowadays is selling quarantine fish. But if I feel confident that they're doing it the right proper way. And that that their customers, which are mostly the members on our forum, are not going to get diseases from these vendors. Then they qualify as, um, you know, to be vendors as quarantine vendors. We also do have some non quarantine vendors. Biota is a good example. We have another one called Premier Reefs, which they're not necessarily quarantine fish, but I feel that they're conditioned um, better than you're going to buy at like a typical local fish shop or online vendor. So we also have that. Um, the dry goods vendors are, they're, they're just basically, they're vendors that sell, um, they sell dry goods, they sell, you know, things you need for the, for the hobby. But I feel, I've got this big thing about, I feel like some vendors in this hobby are unscrupulous. So I try to only support vendors that I feel are basically trying to do the right thing. They're trying to sell a good product, good customer service. They're going to treat the customer properly. So there's no real criteria other than i mean to be on that list other than just be just be a straight up vendor just be someone that's um that's that's scrupulous and has a good big business practices and um you know has good customer service and sells fair honest products are, are you basically getting the uh, the that the, the criteria from your um the users on the forum or is it is it you as well well how, how do you guys um police that sort of thing well, so like with the, well, so for the quarantine vendors, for example, I mean, obviously, if someone feels like they've been sold a diseased fish, then usually the, the person will contact me directly. And I guess you can say I kind of start a little investigation. You know, I start communicating with the person trying to figure out, <clears throat> did the disease come from that vendor or was there another possible vector? Like, you know, because like sometimes I'll, I'll start talking to somebody and they'll tell me, you know, like, well, yes, I did purchase a quarantine fish from from one of your vendors. However, I also went to Petco and bought some snakes. Mm. Well, you then just introduce a possible vector so we don't, we can't really pin it down. Um, if we can pin it down that we think that the vendor was at fault, um, you know, obviously then I then communicate with the vendor. 
try to figure out what's going on on their end. I mean, look, mistakes can and do happen. Yeah. The vendor, a lot of times, will try to make it right, or we just—it's really just kind of like trying to to pin it down to figure out whether the vendor has a problem or the disease act possibly came from another source. Uh, just a sidebar question: So, h- how do you prevent the fish diseases from coming in on? corals, inverts, and what have you that you're getting from other, you know, um, vendors or, you know, any vendor, let's say, I mean, right. what's, what's the, uh, the protocol in terms, you know, I know quarantining is always the best, um, way to try to like, uh, prevent that sort of thing, but it's interesting because fish disease, I, I didn't, I never thought about that in terms of having the possible transferring of a fish disease on a coral. So, um, yeah, just curious what your advice would be if you're bringing in, um, you know, some coral frags or what have you, what, um, how possibly is there a way to prevent that? Oh, definitely. So what you have to do is set up a, basically a fishless frag tank, um, just a frag tank, but there there can be no fish in the aquarium because the fish is the host. So basically, so let's just say you're bringing in some coral or you're bringing some snails or hermit crabs or whatever you're bringing in, you would put the, um, you would put the the animals in the fishless frag tank. Um, ideally, you would raise the water temperature at 81 degrees Fahrenheit because there are studies that have shown that that, um, especially for, for cryptocarrion, marine ick, that increases like the speeds up the life cycle. And then you would start like a six day countdown. So basically what happens is the, the tomones that are on the coral or on the snail shell or whatever will release free swimmers into the water. Well, when the free swimmers don't find a fish host, They've got about 48 hours to find a fish host or they die. Mm. So basically what happens is the parasites basically just starve to death. They burn themselves out because without having a fish host, they can't continue the life cycle. You end the life cycle. And after about six weeks at 81 degrees Fahrenheit, they're like literally there's no possibility that you'll have any more viable tomos on the corals or the snail shells or whatever so at that time, you are, it's then safe to move those animals into your display tank. Yeah, that's interesting because um, I, had a, um, I had a quarantine, 20-gallon little um, you know, breeder tank as a coral quarantine tank that I would basically put any incoming coral like frags, SPS frags, into that tank for 30 days. Hit it um, you know, one time a week with KCL, potassium um, you know, chloride for aquarium flatworms, and then hit it a couple of times mm-hmm. with interceptor during that 30-day period. But I didn't realize that it was also uh, really helping to prevent any fish disease from getting into, the, uh, into my systems. The, um, yes. and, and one of my other questions to you, is, I, I think, was just answered because one of my questions to you was that um, you know, I had uh, an episode a while ago, maybe it was a year and a half ago, where I really had not added any new fish in many, many months, um, maybe even like six months or eight months or 10 months, whatever it was. And uh, I was getting, uh, I was having fish losses and, and I, di- I mm. didn't know exactly what was going on. I didn't know what the disease was, but maybe after tonight I will, because we're going to get into all the specifics of the different ones. But, um, but now I'm realizing that perhaps a um, you know something came in on a uh, a piece of coral that maybe I didn't put into the quarantine system. Maybe it was a piece of L, uh, you know uh, an LPS coral that I don't put in a quarantine tank. So um, interesting. Yes. Yeah. Pretty much anything wet can introduce pathogens into your DT. You know, life finds a way, right? So, um, yeah, there's actually on my forum, there's all these different protocols about, and it, you know, and it's weird because, so for example, you know, like snail shells are like a big snail and hermit crab shells are seem to be a big vector to, to huh. get, you know, cause the tomos into that's probably, an aquarium. That's or, probably what happened yeah. to me because I was like, I always, uh, refresh my cleanup crew and I, I do put in uh, new snails and, and whatnot. And like LPS, you know, cause they have the stony base, but for example, um, uh, starfish and urchins cannot, tomos cannot insist to them. So for those, I just tell people, you know, you just basically do like a quick rinse just in case there were any free swimmers that just happen to be on them. And those actually don't need to be quarantined. Um, soft corals, if you can detach a soft coral from its, its rocky base or from the plug or whatever, um, then you don't really have to quarantine that because again, it's not, not hard. It's soft. Tomos can insist to it. If you have a nice acro frag that is, you know, 100% flesh, like there's no exposed skeleton, and you can detach that from the from the plug, 
mount it to a dry plug, that doesn't have to be quarantined. So basically, it's sort of like if there's a hard surface, that's where the tomos can insist to. If there's not a hard surface, you're probably fine to just give it a rinse and put it right into your DT. When you say give it a rinse, you're talking about a rinse in uh, just tap water? No, no. What I'm talking about is like what I like to do is actually take the animal and actually take like some DT water, like in a pitcher, pour it over it into a bucket of water to be discarded. And then you can do it. So what, what you're just basically like trying to prevent is if there happen to be, you know, what are the odds? But if there happen to be any free swimmers are there are some parasites, Brooklynella, uranema, which do not have an insisted stage, but they could just sort of be, you know, like kind of loosely attached, inadvertently attached, like in a droplet of water on the coral. And it just sort of rinses those away. It's just sort of like another extra little step to take to ensure um, that you're not transferring any diseases into your DT. Hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, you learn something new every day. <laughs> yeah. Fish diseases. It's it, it, the, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and the more, as much as I know, I just keep learning myself. I mean, it just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And, you know, I mean, look, these diseases want to survive mm -hmm. just like anything else. Right. So they adapt and they find ways to, you know, to, to survive and, and make their way into your tank basically. Um, John Wright made a comment about uh, quarantining and stressing fish. I'm, I'm not sure if this is a question, John, but um, I think it's a it's a it's a topic worth talking about, Bobby. And that is the um, you know when you put a fish through quarantine, is is that a a stressful situation for a fish since you're hitting it with a lot of medication and um, it's not in it's going to be in, a, in its natural really a natural environment, or I guess it's going to be a lot less of a natural environment. Right. Absolutely. I mean, there's, it is a stressful thing for a fish to go through and it, it really comes down to the condition of the fish. So if, if you buy a fish and the fish is relatively healthy, the fish is eating, the fish, you know, is a good weight. Um, then obviously that fish has a much better chance of surviving <laughs> quarantine than if you get a fish, you know, sometimes you get fish that are emaciated. Um, sometimes they arrive damaged. I mean, there's all kinds of things. So I tell people that, if, if the fish arrives in pretty good condition, the fish is eating, then you're probably safe to go ahead and, you know, start using medications. If the fish arrives emaciated, if the fish arrives in poor condition, if the fish has been exposed to like ammonia in the bag water, you really want to do what I call preconditioning, which is you basically like you don't want to expose the fish to any medications right away. You want to feed the fish. You want to kind of, you know, build the fish back up until you feel the fish is healthy enough to go through the medications because the medications have their own side effects and everything. Um, but to get back to your, your question, yeah, it's absolutely a stressful experience for the fish, but it, it's the lesser of two evils, I feel, because if you don't, if you take this fish, you put it in your DT, maybe the fish is clean, maybe the fish is harboring a parasite, which then spreads to all your other fish and wipes out your display tank. And then there's also like, you know, going down this rabbit hole of, you know, some people don't quarantine and what they do is I, I call it disease management and they do things like, you know, running a UV sterilizer, running ozone. Uh, they feed really well. They use vitamins. They use probiotics. There's a lot of different little tips and tricks that you can do to manage diseases in your display tank. Um, but everyone has to make that choice for themselves, I feel. Um, so a couple of more questions from the uh, from the viewers. Um I'm not sure I totally understand this NSB, Reese, but let me uh, read what you uh, wrote here. I treated a couple of fish that I received from a tank that had velvet with success. Question is, why did all the other fish die and the ones I have weren't affected? So it, it sounds like this this is a case where um got some fish from a tank that had velvet. Maybe those fish in that other tank eventually died, but then the, uh, the other fish in his tank did not. Um, that could be due to so fish are capable of building up um, both. There's two different things. They're they're capable of building up um, immunity um, and resistance. So if if a fish is we'll use velvet. If a fish is exposed to velvet for the very first time, and because you know because the parasites basically attach to the fish, they they feed on the fish, they drop off. It's like a rinse and repeat. The cycle continues. Every time that the fish is exposed to like velvet then their immune system becomes more and more familiar with the pathogen and their immune system 
you know, it gets better and better at fighting it off. So if a fish is able to survive like successive waves of, of marine velvet disease, eventually its immune system will be able to fight off the parasites and it will be immune. The problem with that is that's great for that fish, but that fish is still what we call a um, like a carrier that doesn't like an asymptomatic carrier. Mm. So that while that fish may not get sick and die, it is capable still of, of being a host to the parasites. And then other fish that it's sharing water with may not have that same immunity, may not have that same resistance, and they may succumb to it. Gotcha. So, Makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Um, Sturgis Reef, what's your opinion on the tank transfer method for a healthy-looking fish? I'm not sure what that method is. Maybe um, he gives an explanation, Bobby. Yes. So tank transfer method is where, well, the, there's, there's different – types of tank transfer method. Um, the, the, the one most people use is this tank transfer method where, so basically you are transferring a fish to a new different quarantine tank every 72 hours. And it's mainly used for ick because marine ick, uh, cryptocarrion has a, the, the life cycle has been well studied. And if you move a fish every 72 hours to a different aquarium for 12 days, what happens is the parasites drop off the fish but because you're constantly moving the fish, that the fish never, the parasites never have a, a chance to reattach mm. because you're basically leading, leaving the tomones behind in one of the older aquariums. Usually people use like, you know, like a small 10 gallon aquarium or even a bucket. You know, it's like a minimal quarantine tank to do tank transfer method. Um, I think it's a great uh, method. If you've got the time and you don't mind the spending the money on salt, I know salt is getting you more and more expensive. Um, it's a great method. I've actually enhanced the method by using hydrogen peroxide. Hmm. So, so basically, um, tank transfer method treats um, ick. However, there was a study that was done many years ago now that if you use hydrogen peroxide at 150 ppm, and there's directions on how to do this on my forum, if you do that twice, six days apart, it also treats marine velvet disease. It will eliminate vel marine velvet disease. And I've also found that it will eliminate Brooklynella. Hmm. So basically what you're doing by doing hybrid tank transfer method and by incorporating hydrogen peroxide baths into the transfers, you're treating ick, velvet, and brook. So you're getting rid of three of the, the biggest threats, three of the parasites, by doing tank transfer method. It's, it's a great method to use. And you're not um, increasing the odds that the fish that's not, you know, came in sort of compromised is going to survive? Um, I feel that... that it actually increases the chances that they will survive because the beauty of tank transfer method is the fish, other than, well, if you use hybrid tank transfer method, you, you do um, two 30-minute peroxide baths. The fish is never exposed to medications. So the, med the problem with the medications, in particular copper, is all the side effects. The, I mean, it causes appetite suppression. The medications deplete oxygen from the water. Um, another big problem is the medications damage a fish's uh, uh, gut flora, gut microbiota, which then damages their immune system. Mm. So if you can use a quarantine um, uh, protocol which utilizes no medications, you're not doing any damage to the fish from the medications. It's just the stress of, of being in quarantine. Right. Another one people like to use is called hyposalinity, is where you drop the specific gravity down to 1.009 for 30 days. That treats ick and flukes. Another well-tolerated quarantine regimen because, again, there's no medications involved. And most fish can easily tolerate dropping the salinity, the, the specific gravity down to 1.009. So tank transfer is kind of the same idea that you're doing a quarantine protocol, but you're not exposing the fish to any harmful chemicals. Can, can you do multiple fish during a, uh, you know, a, uh, the same tank transfer? Yes. As long as they will tolerate one another, you know, the right. aggression between them. Um, and you can keep ammonia under control, which a little trick for that is, you can dose like Amquel or um, Prime every 24 hours to keep ammonia in check. So as long as you keep, uh, you know, aggression between the fish in check, you keep ammonia in check, you can trans you, you can do many fish while doing tank transfer method. So Rich, Rich Colombo is asking, what's your opinion on live blackworms as a regular food several times per week? Awesome. I love live blackworms. Um, they're especially useful they're very high in uh, protein. Um, um, they're, they, uh, uh, they get a, like a feeding response. 
um, especially if you have like finicky fish like uh, butterflies, Moorish idols. Usually that's like one of the first foods that you can start them out on. Um, it's just becoming really hard to get black worms lately. It seems like less and less local fish shops carry them. Some people are doing uh, white worms, which you can actually culture yourself. And they're mm. actually like a, um, it's like a similar to a black worm, but it's like a land worm. And you can feed that to your fish. You can culture it yourself. Uh, Paul B is real big into white worms. And uh, yes, I remember the beautiful that. thing about the beautiful thing about white worms mm. is they actually will live in salt water for 30 minutes. Whereas black worms seem to die like within 10 or 20 seconds. So you've got this little worm kind of wiggling around, which then entices a feeding response from the fish because it's, you know, live food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Wife Price Reaper is wondering what are some reputable places to buy fish. Uh, Go to Humble Fish uh, uh, website, right? And and, uh... Yes. Yeah, if you go onto my forum, we have it kind of broken down. We'll have the the quarantine vendors, dry goods vendors, and the non-quarantine vendors. Um, all of those have been vetted by myself. And quite frankly, if if I find out that they're not, like, you know, say they're a quarantine vendor and they're no longer qu- properly quarantining the fish, we, we remove them. We don't play around with that. Um, I just ask that the vendors do a good job. They do what they say they're going to do. Um, they provide good customer service. I mean, if you're, if you're selling quarantine fish, quarantine the fish properly if you don't quarantine the fish properly i remove you from the forum gotcha so all right reef keepers got a um a point in question here i always felt like treating a totally healthy fish with meds is like getting chemo when you don't have cancer i prefer a very long observation in a separate tank bobby what are your thoughts on that that works if you are willing to spend a lot of time watching the fish. So, I mean, that's that's what's called observational quarantine. It absolutely can work. Um, I mean, what some people do, they'll kind of set up like a, you know, almost like a like a natural environment for the fish. I mean, almost like a like a frag tank, you know, with corals and everything. So the fish has a nice natural environment. Um, they put the fish in there. They watch the fish for usually a couple of months. Um, that absolutely can work. But I just stress that. It's very important to like actually spend a lot of time in front of that tank watching the fish every single day because fish will not all like the fish as it, for example, it doesn't always you won't always see the classic white dots that will tell you the fish has it. Sometimes you see more subtle behavioral symptoms like the fish will scratch. Uh, the fish will um, the fish has flukes. They tend sometimes to yawn or uh, they'll they'll pipe for air. So you have to kind of watch the fish and be sure like you're not noticing any heavy breathing or scratching or anything like that behavioral signs that tell you that this fish possibly has disease needs to be treated for. But as long as you're patient and as long as you're willing to watch the fish, it absolutely can work. Um, What about leveraging aquabiomics? Because they can um, they can determine whether or not you have any uh, fish disease. I mean, unfortunately, you know, Eli's service, the turnaround time can be, um, you know, a number of weeks. So you, you have to kind of like take that into consideration. But um, is, is that something, uh, Bobby, that, um, you know, you, uh, you think is, is worthwhile doing? It's, it would be ideal. I mean, if you're going to uh, put fish in an observational, observational quarantine and you could like, you know, I think you have to give it like a few days, send off a water sample to Eli and have him. He will tell you exactly what diseases are present in the water what, and what diseases that fish may have so you know what to treat for. It's obviously there's a turnaround. Obviously, it's, I think it's like a hundred dollars, so it's yeah. kind of an expensive thing to do. Um, and I, there is an alternative. Now, I'm not going to say the alternative is as good. It's not nearly as good as what Eli does, but it's what I call black molly quarantine. So, if you take freshwater black mollies, um, and they have to be freshwater black mollies, and you convert them to full salt water, it usually takes you know I, I usually like take about a week to do it. So, freshwater black mollies have no immunity, no resistance whatsoever to saltwater fish pathogens. Also being they're black, it's usually easy to see if they have ick or velvet like, you know, on their body. So what I do tell some people to do, what you can do is if you're going to do observational quarantine or you're just going to do this in observation, take the black mollies, put them in the same tank and then use them as sort of like canary in a coal mine fish, right? Mm -hmm. Use them because if, if the fish does have pathogens, the pathogens will eventually get in the water. They will eventually spread to the black mollies. They will tell you that these fish have a disease. Right. And, and black mollies are good because? Well, because for this purpose, because they have no immunity to saltwater diseases. Okay. 
So whereas, like, let's just say you've got a RAS. RASs are infamous for not showing signs of, like, ichor velvet because they have such a thick uh, slime mucus coat, um, a black molly, which has no immunity whatsoever or resistance to ichor velvet. If you put a molly in the same aquarium as an RAS for, like, say, 30 days, more than likely those, tra- those parasites are going to transfer in the water onto the molly, and you're going to see little white dots on the molly. And when the molly hits, as I call it, you know you need to treat the molly and you need to treat the wrasse. Got, that makes sense. Gotcha. All right, Bob, Bob Purcell has a good question. And then I think, Bobby, we'll, we'll get into the specific uh, disease um, part of this uh, live stream because I see somebody else, Jonathan Mills, has a specific question about wondering about a certain disease. And I think that question will be answered when we go through all the different uh, diseases. But let, let's do this one quickly with uh, Bob Purcell. Uh, do you recommend doing um, – you know, the question is, do you recommend me doing my own QT – when buying from a reputable QT vendor? Um, I don't feel if you buy from a reputable QT vendor, I don't feel you need to do well prophylaxis. I don't think you should expose that fish to, to medications or chemicals. I do think it is probably worthwhile, no matter who you buy from, to maybe set up an observational tank and maybe put the fish in observation for a couple of weeks, only because, look, anybody can make a mistake. I mean, you know, quarantine vendors, are doing best to to try to quarantine fish however something can always slip through so um, if you have an observation tank for the fish to go into you can just watch them in non-medicated water for a couple of weeks and just be 100 percent sure that the fish isn't showing any signs of disease yeah makes sense um and then john wright had a related question what are, what are bobby's thoughts on a local fish store who says they quarantine fish again i guess probably follow that advice that you have there in terms of right. observation yeah. Right. And I will say this, like if you're buying from a local fish store, um, then just ask them to be transparent, you know, say that you're interested in purchasing quarantine fish for them. But I would ask to know, like, you know, like what, you know, know, like what is their um, what is their protocol? What medications do they use? Typically, um, any quarantine vendor is going to have to use copper. They're going to have to use formalin or metronidazole and they're going to have to use prosequential, prosipro. Those are the, the four well, main medications that all quarantine vendors are going to have to use to, to treat fish for the various diseases. Um, you can also ask to, like, see where they quarantine the fish. Mm. Uh, you know, usually they'll have an area in the back. Um, and the way it's supposed to work is you quarantine fish in batches. You use the medications in a separate area. And then once the fish are done with the medications, you then move the fish into a retail section, which is, you know, in a separate area from the quarantine area. And that's when the fish are put up for sale. Um, so I would just ask to just, you know, you know, know the details, you know, I mean, how, how, what, what percent would you say of local fish stores actually go through that whole quarantine process? Because what you're describing to me sounds like it would, it would cost, um, you know, some decent money for a local fish store to have the space and the equipment and the uh, manpower to do all that. Very, very few. Look, I, I um, consult with some LFSs and I mean, you know, some LFSs approach me and they're like, hey, look, I want to quarantine all my fish. And once I explain to them just what you said, everything you have to go through, they're like, I can't do yeah. that. Or, so basically the, the only way you can do it is if you then can like sell the fish for more money. So if a fish costs 100 bucks normally – that's the normal retail price. You can't go through all this quarantining and everything you have to do and still only sell the fish for a hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you have to sell the fish for 150 or 200 bucks. Yeah. So every LFS has to know, do they have enough of enough customers that are willing to pay that extra money to make it worthwhile to go through all this? Because you can't just sell a fish for regular retail and quarantine the fish. You'll go out of business in no time. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that, that sounds like, um, Yeah. Um, an absolutely uh, understandable situation. All right, I, more questions popping through, but let's get into the uh, let's get into the individual uh, discussion here, uh, Bobby, in terms of different fish diseases. So let's start with bacterial infections, and I got a few pictures that I could show here. So um, let's start by talking about symptoms in terms of what to look for for these um, types of infections. So I'm I'm showing a um, I think this is a, uh, a, a Leonardo Ras, right? Um, that's got kind of a blotchy uh, spot on it. Um, this is a, a yellow-eyed coal tang. Again, it's got a big 
patch of like brown um, skin around its uh, gill plate. Then we're looking at um, another wrasse with some um, kind of like look, looks like some some um, bare spots on its skin, some sores or whatever, right. like red. So the thing with bacterial infections, so basically bacterial infections is kind of a blanket statement to say that harmful bacteria are basically feeding on your fish. And there can be external infections and internal infections. Um, so the, the fit, what you're showing is fish with external, ex external um, right. infections. Unfortunately, it all depends <clears throat> on the species, the bacteria the, that is basically eating away at the fish. Different bacteria cause different symptoms. So for example, Sometimes you'll see fish with um, bacterial infections have like almost like a white, like a white patch or a, like a discoloration, like a like obviously something larger than ick or velvet, but like a very large patch of like gray or brown or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I'm showing that with this yellow eye cold tank. Yeah, so that can be a bacterial infection. A bacterial infection can also be red sores because basically what's happening the bacteria are eating through the scales of the fish uh -huh. and exposing, exposing the flesh. But the tricky thing is red sores can also be uronema. Uh, there's a parasite called uronema, which also causes red sores. And I tell people, look, the only way you're going to know the difference between uronema and like a, so a bacterial infection that would cause red sores, vibri vibrio would be an example. You have to take a skin scrape. You have to look at it under a microscope. You have to see whether or not you see parasites. If you see uronema parasites, well, then you know it's uronema, not a bacterial infection. Um, another bacterial infection, which is real common, is fin rot, fin and tail rot. So if you have a fish, and that's another thing that's a little tricky, if it's a fish where you're seeing like frayed fins um, or like it's just like little pieces that are missing, then you have bacteria that are eating away, harmful bacteria eating away the fins. However, sometimes, People think they have a bacterial infection, and actually it's just another fish is taking little chunks. You oh. know, it's like biting your fish. Gotcha. So it, it can be a little tricky determining sometimes whether it's a bacterial infection or uronema. Is it is it fin rot, which can be a bacterial infection, or um, is it um, um, like, like, you know, just aggression from another fish? Also flukes, worms um, can also eat at a fish, away to fish's uh, fins. Um, so in, in, in scale. So, you know, it, sometimes different pathogens have the same, sim, uh, the same symptoms. So it can be kind of tricky to, to tell. The only way to really tell, and most people are not going to go through this, is you can do what's called gram testing where you can take like a, like a swab or a skin scrape and you can do like, um, like a, a color test to it. And it, um, I think if it's, um, uh, Think of it's violet, like a purplish color. It's gram negative. It's blue. It's gram positive. But that's the only way to know for certain if a fish actually has a bacterial infection it's by doing. It's called gram gram stain testing. Okay. And so, what are your treatment options then if you determine that you've got a bacterial infection? Mostly, okay. So it depends. If it's a minor bacterial infection, like a very minor bacterial infection, you know, a fish's immune system will kick in and try to fight it off. You can aid the fish's immune system by food soaking, vitamins, um, uh, probiotics are a good one. There's actually, there's been some research done, beta glucan soaked into the food helps. Um, and then what you're basically doing is you're boosting the fish's natural immune system to overcome the infection naturally. Now, if the, it's a very severe infection, unfortunately, you have to resort to antibiotics. The optimal way to administer antibiotics is through an intramuscular injection. Mm. Not many hobbyists are going to yeah. do that. So then you're kind of down to, putting the fish in a quarantine tank and dosing um, medications. Or if you can't do that, you can sometimes food soak um, antibiotics and you can use a binder to make them reef safe and do that in your DT. Now, I want to tell everybody this. The FDA, um, starting in this year in 2024, is coming down hard on um, companies selling fish antibiotics. Mm. So I do not know how much longer fish antibiotics are going to be available because um, they're, they've already sent out, sent out like warning letters uh, to certain companies that I know of uh, telling them that, you know, the, the antibiotics are not like have not been officially vetted by the FDA and to remove them from your shelf. So I do not know how much longer um, in the United States we're going to be able to buy fish antibiotics. What, would you be able to get a prescription through a vet? 
Yes, that would be the only way. You'd have to get a prescription from a veterinarian, and then you you could get that prescription then filled, like usually like a compounding pharmacy would fill it, but that will become the only way, that could become the only way that you can get fish antibiotics in the near future. So you got to have a vet that's um, going to do you a solid, right, pretty much, because yes. not all vets are going to write a script for that. And how many vets really do exotic animals, right? Most vets kind of focus on like, you know, dogs, cats, maybe birds or, yeah. and, you know, stuff like that. I mean, I don't know too many veterinarians. They're pretty few and far between, unless you live in a big city that specialize in reptiles and fish and whatnot. Yeah. You know, I, um, I was able to get my vet to write me a, a script for interceptor, you know? So, and, and I yeah. told him exactly what I was doing, you know, using it for. And, and, um, you know, he, he, uh, just wanted some proof or some evidence of what I was doing and I provided it and he did it. Right. So, you know, sometimes that you, you can find a vet like that, that's cool. And they'll write you a prescription, but then other times they just don't want anything yeah. to do with it, or they don't really understand what you're talking yeah. about. Or they like want you to bring the fish in. I mean, how are you going to do that? Right. Like you bring the fish in a bucket or something. I mean, <laughs> um, so I don't know, like it hasn't really like they, they, they sent out the warning letters. I know they've kind of started it up. I don't know how far they're, they're going to take it. I don't know how, much they're going to police it we're all kind of waiting and see i just know that starting in january 1st 2024 they have started sending out warning letters to companies that are selling fish antibiotics mm. that's gonna hurt um yes it is great bitter reef paul's asking is there a certain shelf life for the antibiotics so if you already have some usually two years mm -hmm. um However, you can, with all medications, including antibi antibiotics, if you put them in the freezer, it will prolong the shelf mm. life because it slows down the, the, yeah, the decay of the medications and, and everything. Like, for example, um, you know, people that use chloroquine um, to treat like parasites, if you put that usually it has a shelf life of two years. But um, if you put it in the freezer, I've had it tested that stuff that was like four or five years old and it was still effective. Yeah. Well, I guess if you can't get it and you've got it. Then uh, it's worth giving it a shot, right? <laughs> Maybe stock up now. So uh, there's a, a vendor on my forum, um, Everything Aquatic. He sells pharmaceutical grade antibiotics. So I mean, maybe people who want to go there might want to stock up um, on it before they can no longer get it. Interesting. Because hmm. that's what people in Canada are already dealing with. Oh, you know, really? and I know, well, in other parts of the world, but in Canada, um, I don't, they can't even buy copper anymore. They can't buy copper. They can't buy really any fish medications um, unless they get a pres uh, prescription from a veterinarian. So what, what, what's the government's fear about um, this? I mean, is it just the, the general sense that, you know, having antibiotics available over the counter is not a good thing, no matter what the antibiotics are for? They're worried about it getting into the water supply. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously we drink it and then developing um, like resistant right. bugs, like resistant bacteria. Yeah. That's that's yep. their position. Yep. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, bacterial tufts and viral nodules. Let's uh, let's talk yes. about that. I got a few pictures of those. So those those are weird. So those are they actually look a lot like it, yes. Um, but but they're so the thing the way you can distinguish them is basically like so ick for example is very close to the body. It's almost like a white bump. Usually, if a fish has bacterial tufts or or, or viral nodules you'll actually kind of see like a, a growth that protrudes away from the scales and skin. Mm. So basically, and this, this happens a lot of times that fish that are exposed to medications, actually. Um, a fish will have a, a, a virus that's dormant in its body, the stress from the medications then induces symptoms, or sometimes there's like a bacterial issue, um, and you'll see like these white marks, dots on the fish, which are just their, their tufts or nodules. The good thing about bacterial tufts and viral nodules usually don't need medication. Um, this is usually something that if you just get the fish in the clean water and if you food soak vitamins, probiotics, and beta, beta glucan, usually symptoms will clear on their own without the need for, for medications. So it's just something that can be a little scary because you're like, you're like, I just quarantined this fish and now I'm seeing what looks like ick on the fish. But if you actually look at like the page you're looking at right here, you'll actually see, and there's all kind of pictures, it's actually bacterial tufts and viral nodules. It's actually becoming more and more common, especially with hippo tangs. For some strange reason, hippo tangs seem to be notorious for this. Mm. Uh, and, and did you mention um, treatment options? Uh, mainly just vitamins, just vitamins in the food, probiotics in the food, um, clean water, 
um, basically it's usually it's usually like it's 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 a it's something that happens when the fish is stressed out when the fish is in quarantine the fish is exposed to medications you just when quarantine is done remove them from that environment um, put them in your DT clean water and food soak um, vitamins and also proper nutrition I mean I just want to touch on that a little bit don't feed your fish pellets and flakes feed your fish clams muzzles um, scallops I mean feed them what they would eat in the ocean you know pellets so you talk about pellets you're not a big fan of pellets well i don't mind it as like a like look i know everybody like you know sometimes we're on the run and it's it's good for supplemental feeding but and i know probably this is something that like you and paul talk about but i just kind of feel like um really we should try to whatever the fish eats in the ocean mm -hmm. so like for example wrasses right so a lot of wrasses in the ocean they're pot eaters so you really should try to, like in your DT, you should have a healthy pod, copepod and amphipod population because that's what they eat. And then, then the, the, we'll say the pellets supplement their income. Um, if you have predator fish, they eat crustaceans and whatnot. So, you know, that would be a good example to feed um, like shrimp and, well, mycid shrimp or uh, mussels and, and things like that. Um, if you have herbivores, you want to feed them a lot of nori because, you know, surgeon fish, tangs, whatnot, fox face, rabbit fish – they eat a lot of nori in the wild. They eat a lot of algae in the wild. Most of our aquariums do not grow sufficient algae to feed them, so then you have to supplement their diet, diet with nori. Um, so I'm just a big fan of um, – and then I know when you talk to Paul next time, he touches on this. So anything that's like, that's like frozen seafood, we'll say, the bacteria doesn't die. The good bacteria doesn't die. So what happens is when a fish eats that, it actually fuels and, and it helps their, their gut microbiota. And the gut microbiota is what fuels the immune system. So, and pellets and flake don't really do that, I feel. And, and a side note, um, pathogenic bacteria can also get transferred via frozen food. Yes, it can. So two things, freezing does not kill, it does not kill bacteria, it does not kill, kill viruses. So yes, so, but there's, there's always a downside by feeding frozen seafood, you could inadvertently uh, introduce pathogenic pathogenic bacteria and viruses into your aquarium as possible. Um, and I, and I, I'm not sure if you and I talked about this the last time you were on, Bobby, or if I talked about this with somebody else, or maybe it was another um, yeah, another guest on the live stream, but uh, is there a way to like prevent uh, that potentially from happening in terms of transferring those uh, pathogenic bacteria to the tank? I mean, if you um, microwave the food for a certain amount of time, is is that you get introducing yeah. UV in there to, to, to kill them? Is there any way to do that? I, I tell people that are worried about getting harm. So, so back, harmful bacteria and viruses are not, to me, as big of a problem in an aquarium as, as parasites and worms because there's less of them. So the whole problem with parasites and worms in an aquarium is, is, the, is the lack of dilution, right? The, the population. I mean, there's just so many of them. When you have bacteria and viruses in your aquarium, um, there's just not, there's, there's not many of them. So I kind of feel like if you run like a UV sterilizer, that's, which is excellent for killing bacteria in the water column, that is going to siphon out enough, um, of the bacteria that it's not really going to harm your fish. The other thing is fish are more adept at fighting off bacteria and viruses naturally than parasites and worms. So I don't even worry. Look, if you get a little like harmful bacteria, I think almost every aquarium has harmful bacteria in the water. I don't really worry about that too much because I feel that as long as you're keeping a fish's natural immune system in good condition, it's going to fight that off naturally. I worry more about parasites and worms mostly because of the numbers game. Mm. Because, you know, out in the ocean, you have a gazillion gallons of water diluting uh, parasites and worms, you know, from the fish. That's why they're able to manage it in a glass box, unless you're having like, you know, like a 17, 18,000 gallon aquarium or something. If you have this in the smaller tank you have, the parasites just keep reproducing. They just keep spreading, spreading. And the pure numbers tend to just overwhelm a fish's natural immune system. So I just don't worry so much about, about bacteria and viruses as I do parasites and worms. Gotcha. Um, getting back to the bacterial tufts and viral, uh, nodules, uh, who was asking this question? Yeah. Alex, uh, Ramos, uh, how long do the tufts last? 
you know, that varies. They can be gone in days. And I know some of our QT vendors have had to hold on to fish for months hmm. because they're still showing signs of, of, um, of tufts. So one of the viral nodules, one of the most, I guess, that most people know about viral nodules, it's called lymphocystis. And it's uh, some people call it cauliflower disease. And that is a, a virus which usually causes like these white, almost like cauliflower growths that are on, usually it forms on a fish's uh, spines and fins. Um, and that's another one of those things. Lympho can be gone in days or sometimes it can drag on for weeks or even months, just depending on, you know, the fish's, because basically the fish's natural immune system has to fight off the virus enough to send the virus back into remission so that the virus stops producing symptoms. And that's really kind of what it comes down to. So if you have a really healthy fish, if you're feeding really well, if you're food soaking vitamins, uh, bacterial tufts and, nod and viral nodules are probably going to clear quickly. If the fish is maybe not in the best water conditions or you're not, you know, feeding the best, then the symptoms could drag on for a long while. I mean, I hate to kind of make this comparison. It's kind of like herpes in humans. Um, mm. It can it can clear up quickly or it can drag on for weeks. It just everyone's a little different, and fish are the kind of the same way. Uh, what are the odds of the fish not making it if you don't do anything in terms of the bacterial infections and the bacterial tufts and viral uh, nodules? So bacterial tufts um, and viral nodules, I mean, even if, if you don't actually, if all you do is like, you know, food soak vitamins and prognosis is usually pretty good. Bacterial infections greatly depends on severity. Um, if you got a fish that just has like very like minor, like, a, like, like, you know, one little spot or maybe the fins are slightly frayed odds are the fish is going to recover on its own. But when you start seeing a fish that has red sores or large growths on it are like, um, like the, the, the fins are almost like, you know, are almost like eroded down to the nub, then yeah, prognosis not good becomes, you no. know, not good. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's move on to, um, black ick, which is something I didn't even realize was a, uh, potential, uh, issue. So I'm showing a couple of pictures there of this, um, what kind of tang is that? It's a yellow. Um, is that that's not a probably like a like a uh, like an orange like a juvenile orange yeah, shoulder yeah. maybe. Perhaps yeah. yeah, yeah. So what those are? Those are tulubularian flatworms. Um, they're a type of flatworm that that infects fish. Um, and it what happens is it, usually it seems only tangs are infected by black ick. Uh -huh. um, and you'll see like you see in the pictures like the little small black you know because it's the little. Yep. The little flatworms on the fish. The good news about it, usually one dose of Prozzi Pro kills it. And that's um, reef safe or not? Well, so Prozzi Pro is sort of reef safe, but it, it's, it's mostly reef safe. So most people who use, who dose Prozzi Pro into the reef tank are not going to experience any problems. However, there have been some instances, and we can't seem to figure out why this happens, where um, like certain sensitive corals like Acropora will bleach. Mm. Um, anemones will sometimes bleach. Sometimes it's a bleaching event and then the, the corals bounce back. Once the medication's out of the water, sometimes it does more damage. Um, so I kind of like to say it's quasi reef safe. Um, With, uh, risk. You don't. <laughs> yeah, it's got a risk. But there is risk. Yeah. yeah. Anytime you put a chemical, um, you know, it's like, uh, people that use, um, you were talking about for AEFW for the Acropora eating flatworms, the potassium chloride. Yeah, I mean, usually it works out great, but every now and then, you yeah, know, you gotta, it you causes gotta, you problems. Gotta, you got a fragmental flame out. Um, so the right. best um, course is to get that fish out of the tank and treat it in a separate hospital tank. That would be ideal, but if if I tell people, look, if you've got flukes or black ick. Um, in your reef tank and you've got a large number of fish and you know mm. that you can't catch all that fish and quarantine them, just, just dose Prozzi Pro in the DT. I mean, just, just take the risk because the odds are greatly in your favor that it's not going to kill your corals or if it does, it may kill one or two frags. It's not going to wipe out the whole system. That That's extremely rare. Gotcha. But if you've got that prize acro collection, then you might want to think twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes it it i mean it's risk versus reward yeah. right you know yeah um yeah yeah <laughs> i hear you all right you mentioned uh brooklynella so this is a, a disease that primarily afflicts clownfish um um sometimes other fish but usually it's just clownfish <laughs> what it does these are parasites that actually cause 
instead of like fine white dots on a fish, it actually causes like, like, like basically what's happening is the fish's mucus is, is sloughing. So basically hmm. when a fish has, when a clownfish has Brooklynella, you'll kind of see white mucus sloughing off the fish or coming off the fish. And sometimes it's even like streams, like streams of snot in the water. Um, the best treatment is formalin, either formalin baths or um, in tank formalin. You can dose formalin in a quarantine tank for, for 10 days. Um, freshwater dips will provide temporary relief. Hydrogen peroxide baths will provide temporary relief. Usually metronidazole, you can, which is CCAM Metroplex is the aquarium brand. Um, that will usually clear it up as well. We are starting to see more, for some strange reason, Brooklynella that's resistant to metronidazole. I've seen more and more of that on my forum. I don't know what that's what's going on with that because you know metronidazole used to be a pretty standard treatment for Brooklynella, but we are starting to see more and more cases of Brooklynella surviving uh, metronidazole for some reason. And by the way, metronidazole is another medication that could possibly be banned by the FDA because it is technically classified as an antibiotic. So <clears throat> Todd from Champion Lighting and Supply is um, commenting about something we we're just talking about, and he's talking about Pro Prozipro containing um, polypropylene glycol. Is that how you pronounce it? I probably totally butchered um, that one. Um, he says better to use um, Prozzi Quantel powder mixed with ethanol vodka. Yeah, so one of the issues with Prozzi Pro is the agent that's used to dissolve it, and I think it's oxybispropanol. I may be mispronouncing it. Um, that that solvent has issues. Um, it and the main issue that it has is it tends to sometimes cause bacterial blooms. So basically, it's like it's like it's alcohol is what you're dosing. So sometimes what happens is then it, it causes a bacterial bloom in the water column. So the water will turn cloudy. The bacteria start propagating. The bacteria then start start to outcompete the fish for oxygen. So sometimes when you have a like a severe bacterial bloom and the water turns very cloudy, you can actually like asphyxiate your fish because, well, the bacteria are out competing them for oxygen. Um, so what some people have found is a safer alternative is to buy powder prosequantol. Powder prosequantol is not easily water soluble, so you have to use a solvent. Ethanol um, hmm. is an alternative. I personally like DMSO. Um, it's actually a solvent that you can buy at, um, oh, Tractor Supply actually sells it. It's a horse solvent. But you can use that. And there's like a, a videos on my form how to use it. You can use that to dissolve Prosequantol before you dose it. And that does not seem to cause bacterial blooms. Gotcha. Um, Andrew Sandler talking about Intercept says that uh, it has Prosy in it and, and that I already did it um, in terms of dosing it to my uh, my SPS tank. I actually... I hit my uh, my SPS system with uh, with Interceptor uh, many years ago when I had some uh, red bugs in there. But I, I uh, when I when I so now when I use the Interceptor, I use it in my uh, fishless quarantine coral uh, tank. But that's interesting that um, that Interceptor's got Prozzi in it. So I guess uh, you can kind of kill two birds with one stone there if you want to uh, yeah to uh, annihilate your um, parasitic copepods and uh, the uh, <laughs> Uh, Brooklynella. So, what was the other uh, thing I saw here? Oh, um, Sturgis Reef. How long would you need to leave the tank fallow for Brooklynella? Six weeks. Six weeks. So I tell people nowadays, six weeks fallow will will pretty much eliminate every disease. Um, um, and I tell them, but for ick, I so it will eliminate every disease, but ick. However, because we have that study now that shows that. Um, 81 degrees Fahrenheit actually speeds up its life cycle. Cycle. If you can, during the fallow period, raise your DT temperature to 81 degrees Fahrenheit, and you can go fallow for six weeks, then that will take care of everything, including it. The one and only, the one and only disease that going fallow will not eliminate is uranema, because uranema has no fallow period. Because uranema, in the absence of, of fish flesh, can actually subsist off detritus, bacteria. It can actually like live in your tank indefinitely, even without fish. Sounds like it's a really bad thing. It so uranema is um, most people see it. It's those red sores that you'll sometimes see on Chromis damsels. Um, I got, let's, um, let's jump to that. I got some pictures yeah. of that. 
Yeah. It's red swords that you'll see on Chromus damsels. Uh, some, a lot of, sometimes you'll see it on Antheus. Um, and the really bad, bad thing about uranema is it can spread internally. Mm. So uranema can actually like, um, infect a fish's internal organs. It can actually infect their cells. It can actually infect their brain. Mm. It is basically, it is a nightmare disease. It is for my, um, the fish QT vendors on my forum. It is, it is a nightmare. It is an absolute nightmare because it's the one disease that, and it's, and it's resistant to medications. Formalin usually works, but not always. Um, I've had some good success using chloroquine to eliminate it. Um, there's a vendor on my forum, um, Jeff, who owns, why well, am I drawing a blank right now? But anyway, I'll get to back in a minute. He's actually been doing uh, experiments with tea tree oil, uh, Milafix, uh, to a Milafix bath, tea tree oil to, to treat fish with uranema with some success. But it's the one disease that we don't really have a good answer for to tell people that, you know, this is the way you consistently can treat to get rid of it. Because even like formalin, which is a standard treatment for uranema, we've seen cases where uranema um, actually can get through formalin. Yeah. And still infect your tank. I mean, my the QT vendors have been shut down numerous times because formalin has made it has made its way into their observation tanks before they sold the fish, and they've had to requarantine the fish from scratch and bleach all the systems. Wow. So, um, yeah. how common is that? I mean, what what uh, is that like a uh, a somewhat common, you know, disease that we're seeing now? I mean, especially in green Vic chromis. Very, very common in green chromis. I, mm. I, mean, I mean, I would tell people, unless you buy it from a QT vendor, do not mess with green chromis because they are very, very likely to have uranema. Wow, man, I, I did not know this stuff. I mean, <laughs> I, I have some yeah. green chromis in my tanks, and I guess I'm not going to be adding to the population. I mean, Luis uh, Reef Exotica by Luis Aceves says that that's why I'm scared to introduce chromis. I, I had yeah. no freaking idea, man. Antheus can be bad. Antheus have it sometimes. Hmm. Uh, butterfly fish and angel fish can sometimes have it, but it seems like chromis are are the worst for getting it, and they're, hmm. they're also the most difficult to treat. It seems like um, a lot of times the formalin baths and the formalin treatment works with the Antheus and with the angels and with the butterfly fish, but then it's the chromis that sometimes – I mean, I don't even think my QT vendors will sell chromis anymore because it's not worth the risk. Wow. Of, of possibly introducing uranema into the system. Andrew Sandler says it's a purple queen uh, antheus killer. Yep. So, so he's had problems with, with getting antheus, and I'm pretty sure he treats for formalin. So he probably had a, a case where a, a uranema got through formalin. Those are um, those are just absolutely gorgeous antheus, the uh, purple queens, but they just don't yes, stay alive. Yeah, they're pot eaters. Um, I've I've only had success with those treating uh, um, using what is that food? Um, calanus. Sometimes you get that you know that pe calanus, the little red pods, the frozen pods. They'll sometimes eat that, but they're very difficult to get eating. Um, captive aquatic ecosystems. Why does that sound familiar? I don't know. Um, is that Ben? That, uh, anyway, uh, how communicable yeah. is uranema? Very. Um, so basically what happens is the parasites are on the fish. They get, in, they get into the water. Um, they get into the water column. They then basically get into the rocks and the sand and all that. And like the real problem with uranema in the display tank, um, and there is some good news coming at the end of this um, with uranema in a display tank is that it then gets into the rocks. It gets into the sand. It starts subsisting off detritus and bacteria and everything. It doesn't necessarily have to have a fish host. The good news is, um, actually, there is on my form. It's not. I, I can't take credit for this. So while I've done a lot of research into hydrogen peroxide baths, my uh, my fellow admin on um, Humble Dot Fish has done experimentation with in tank peroxide dosing. So this is where you're basically dosing hydrogen peroxide directly into your, your display tank over a six-week period. We have had both, and this was confirmed with, you know, eDNA testing by Aquabiomics, where, um, where uranema was present in the aquarium. The, on more than one occasion, the person did the six-week peroxide dosing. They did a follow-up test, and there was no more uranema. So apparently, uranema is um, susceptible to hydrogen peroxide. 
because there's been more than one case of using hydrogen peroxide to eliminate it from a display tank. And uh, you're you're kind of playing a little Russian roulette there when you're doing the hydrogen peroxide dosing. It could, it's yes. risky. Yes, yes, because you can. Uh, snails seem snails seem to have difficulty surviving the treatment. Shrimp seem to have difficulty surviving the treatment. Some people have reported corals of dying. It's one of those risk reward things where how important is it that you want to get your anema out of your DT? Yeah, I had I had a brownout incident after dosing uh, hydrogen peroxide, so it's something you got to really be yeah. very careful with. Um, yes. All right, man. Moving on, clownfish hyper -melaniz melanization. Yes. So that's not a disease. That's just a condition. That's basically when a clownfish comes in contact with an anemone or a coral that is stinging it. Like it's it's not playing nice we'll just say with a coral or an enemy the maybe the coral hasn't quite accepted that that you know it's going to be the, its host so what will happen sometimes or it seems to really happen if a sometimes if a clownfish um tries to use like a like a euphelia coral like a frog spawn or a, yeah as a host and then the, especially if the the sweepers at night hit the clownfish so what happens is it stings the the, the clownfish and you see these little dark spots on it, which is a result of the stings. That's usually something that just self-corrects. Usually either the clownfish leaves that host alone or the host eventually accepts the clownfish and the stinging stops. So I just tell people don't do anything about it. Just let them work it out. It, it sort of looked like um, black ick a little bit in terms of the uh, pictures that I was showing with the clownfish that had it. But... How, how often do you get, um, you know, is oh. there confusion in terms of misdiagnosing stuff? I mean, certain things can look um, pretty similar, right? I mean, ick and, and bacterial tufts and viral no nodules, to me, kind of look ickish. So black, um, black ick is usually only seen on tangs. I mean, I can't ever remember it, you know, there being like a non that had black ick. So that's pretty, you know, easy to narrow down. And uh, hypermelanization usually only happens with clownfish. Okay. So usually, if a you know somebody posts a picture of their clownfish with black dots, we can pretty much just say it's not black ick. It's probably going to be hypermelanization. Um, but yeah, you are right about the um, the bacterial tufts and nodules. Those can look very similar to ick, and we really kind of have to go back and forth with the person we're trying to help to try to pin that down to make sure it's not. So another way to notice that, so for example, ictrophonts, which produce the white spots, they only stay on a fish for three to seven days. So if the white spot persists for longer than seven days, you know it has to be something else. You know it has to be a bacterial growth or a viral growth of some kind because it will drop off of a fish after seven days max. So just a couple of uh, comments there, Ben Johnson, Captive Aquatic Ecosystems. I knew that sounded familiar there, Ben, but uh, it says, he says, thank you so much for all this education, Bobby, and thank you, Keith, for the show. Um, appreciate you tuning in there, Ben. And um, Mike Campbell uh, made the comment, hi, Keith and Bobby, haven't lost any fish in QT since I started following the guidelines. And Humble Fish, thanks for taking the time to educate everyone. So uh, some kudos to you, Bobby, and the, um, the forum in terms of helping people out. So um, eye issues. Let's talk about eye problems, eye infections, and the cloudy eyes. How, um, how does that stuff develop? Again, is it some sort of bacterial infection that gets into the eye? So it can be a bacterial infection. However, so it is one of those things where it can be multiple diseases causing the same symptom. It can be a bacterial infection. However, flukes also get um, in a fish's eye. And if flukes, you know, worms get in the fish's eye, usually the first symptom is it causes a swelling. So you'll see Popeye. So sometimes Popeye um, then can be a symptom of flukes. However, Popeye can also be a symptom of the, the eye protrusion of fish just, you know, bumps its head or its eye into like a rock mm -hmm. and the eye, you know, swelling develops. If the eye starts to turn cloudy, um, you have to look very, very closely. If, if it's just like a, like a white, like a milky solid white thing over the eye, that's usually a bacterial infection. If you look very, very closely and you see very small little white animals inside the fish's eye, Ooh. that usually means there's flukes. 
So you have to look really closely at the eye. Are we talking about just a white, like a white solid sheen over the eye? Are we talking about little white spots inside the eye, which then are flukes? Um, And I'm showing flukes here, too, uh, on this one clownfish. And then there's a close-up, I think, on the, uh, I can't tell what part of the body. Maybe that's the uh, dorsal fin in some fish. So Mm. flukes are translucent in salt water. So you're primarily only going to see them on a dark colored fish. So if you notice in those photos, the clownfish is black. And I believe it's like the purple spot of a royal grama. So if a fish has like a dark colored fish, like, you know, if you had like an Achilles tang or a black tang or something, you're going to see flukes on the fish. For a lot of other fish, light colored fish, yellow tang or something like that, um, you're not going to see flukes on the fish. The only way to confirm skin flukes is to give the fish a five minute freshwater dip. What happens is... When marine flukes are exposed to fresh water, they turn a solid white color, Hmm. fall off, and settle on the bottom of, like, the dip container. Um, So that that confirms skin flukes. However, gill flukes are microscopic, and they usually are not able to be seen in a freshwater dip. So with gill flukes, you have to rely (laughs) on, again, we're back to behavioral symptoms. Uh, uh, The fish is, is yawning. The fish is twitching its head. Uh, the fish is 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 breathing heavily. The fish might be gulping air from the surface of the um, from the surface of the tank, and those are kind of clues that you might be dealing with gill flukes. Okay. One thing I forgot to mention, <clears throat> Bobby, is that um, all this information is on humble fish, right? Yep. So there yep. there 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 are um, there is a list in terms of um, pictures and symptoms and treatment options on humble fish for all these diseases that we're going over tonight. I think we're um, perhaps maybe digging um, deeper in, in some regards and some of this stuff. And it also gives you folks out there an opportunity to ask some, um, some questions, but um, you know, certainly digest what you're hearing and seeing on the stream, but also go to humble fish as the, uh, as kind of like your little, um, I guess, encyclopedia for, for fish uh, yes. disease and treatments. Yeah, we have basically, we call them stickies, but um, the forum, we have like information on every single disease, every single treatment, detailed information. Um, I also am trying to uh, make videos, like I have a YouTube channel, uh, Humble Fish and Reef, and I make YouTube videos, which basically it's the same exact information. It's just basically in like video format to yep. accompany the, the written information. So um, eye infections, um, Popeye... What do you suggest people do? So if the, if, if the eye is just popped, so basically if it's like a swollen eye and it's clear, that will usually self-correct without, you know, any need for treatment. Um, if you're seeing like the little white flukes inside the eye, obviously you have to, here's the, here's a, uh, the kicker. So you have to treat with Prozipro just like you would regular flukes. <laughs> However, so here's the problem with Prozipro in eye flukes. Proziquantil causes flukes to spasm before they drop off a fish's body. That's obviously not something you want to have happen inside of a fish's eye because it could cause like, you know, retina damage. So what I advise is if you think a fish has um, eye flukes, give the fish a a five minute freshwater dip first. That will gently dislodge the flukes without causing the spasm and then do a follow-up treatment with Prozipro to be sure you've got them all. Um, So you have to be a little careful when you're treating a fish with eye flukes with, with Prozipro. Um, if a fish has a bona fide eye bacterial infection, um, the best antibiotic I found is ethromycin, which happens to be the active ingredient found in Maricin 1. Um, sometimes if it's a gram negative eye infection, you'll have to use minocycline, which is the active ingredient found in Maricin 2. And I know Fritz Aquatics still makes both of those medications. And um, will those uh, medications be uh, in risk of not being available at some points? <laughs> uh, that's, that's, I don't know. That, that's a very interesting question. You know, we're all kind of holding our breath and uh, waiting to see what's going to happen with that. So like, like you're saying, Bobby, I think uh, the best, uh, if you want to be sure, start, <laughs> start buying up a good supply of uh, medications. That, put them in uh, the freezer. Yeah, so they, they last longer. You know, put them, buy medications, put them in the freezer, and they should last, I'd say, five years easy if you freeze them. Okay. Um, flukes, a- anything else you want to talk about in terms of flukes in general? Um, so here, okay, well, okay, so here's the interesting thing about flukes. Because flukes are basically like little tiny worms that are crawling over the surface of a fish, 
you can actually use cleaner fish and cleaner wrasses hmm. to get rid of flukes. So it's not like a, a parasite like ick, which, you know, gets in under the outer skin layer. It's this little bitty, it's basically it's a little animal, little flatworm that's just, you know, crawling around on the fish. So actually for management purposes, cleaner wrasses, cleaner shrimp would be effective in at least controlling um, um, flukes. The problem with flukes is they lay eggs. So just like, you know, like when you're dealing with, uh, with flatworms, parasitic flatworms, they're constantly laying eggs. So the thing is, you're probably not going to ever get rid of them all mm. because they're, you know, they're, they're constantly laying eggs, the eggs hatch, you got baby flukes. Um, it's difficult to completely rid your system of them without doing a treatment. Ah, oh, man, there's so, so many things, so many, uh, it, so, it's so a, many it's obstacles, deep, right? It? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I like to give, you know, some people are like, are like, you know, you, you have to quarantine all the fish you have. You can, you know, I like to give people options. It's like, look, not everybody's going to quarantine. People are looking for alternatives. Some people are just going to manage it in their tank. And there are ways of doing that. There are ways of doing, maybe we could do another uh, podcast or whatever about that, about just ick management, disease management. It can be done. It's just, you have to know what you're doing and you have to, you have to have certain things in place. So what I tell people just briefly, you have to do two things. You have to keep the number of pathogens in your aquarium down to a sublethal population. So basically what you're doing, you're duplicating their natural environment. Because in a natural environment, there's not like a million ichtherons chasing the fish around. It's, it's down to a more manageable level. So you can use like a UV sterilizer. You can do, use do, you think, do you think pretty much every reef aquarium should be using UV? I think it's not, I don't see it. I don't see a downside to it other than the cost of it, other than the cost of replacing the lamps every six months. I see no downside to using a UV sterilizer. I mean, you know, the, so, da the downside yeah. that, you know, potentially you would, you would get arguments from, from some folks that uh, UV will kill some beneficial bacteria that could impact the microbiome in a negative way. But, but I feel more that bacteria is like in the rock, in the sand, it's not in the water column. So while yes, you, you will kind of kill some beneficial bacteria in the water column, I don't feel like you're going to put a serious dent in it because most of that's in your rock. It's in your sand. It's not floating around free floating in the water, but it will, a uh, UV will kill free floating bacteria. It will kill virus, uh, uh, that have been shed into the water. It will kill, uh, free swimming parasites that are in the water. So I think the upside of UV outweighs the downside and you know ozone's another thing and that's another controversial thing you know using ozone because you have to have it you know just right not to harm your other animals um, but there are ways that you can do to kill the nasties that are in your aquarium and keep them at a sub lethal level now the other side of the equation and this is huge is we're back to nutrition you have you have to keep your your fish in their their immune system and their health in tip-top condition and that's when proper nutrition comes into play. That's when uh, I feel vitamins come into play and um, uh, probiotics and all these other things and feeding like, you know, actually like like food that has live bacteria in it, which I know is something, you know, Paul talks about a lot. And I agree with him 100 percent. You know, the gut bacteria, to, the gut bacteria, we have to just like we have to feed ourselves right. We have to feed our fish right if we want them to be healthy and we want their immune systems to be in tip top condition to fight off whatever nasties are in the water. Cause that's what they do in nature. Um, if, if somebody, you know, fed their fish a diet of frozen brine shrimp and frozen mice shrimp, is that enough? I feel you need to do more than that. I feel you need to expand into clam meat, mussels, oyster meat. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I really, I really like LRS foods. And if you actually go on his website, he actually has like all the ingredients that he puts in his little blends. And if you, I mean, if you can do that yourself, if you can buy all that stuff and make your own food, then I think you're doing well. Otherwise, I would stress uh, buying, you know, LRS foods. I know Rod's food makes a, a blend, um, someone that's basically doing that for you. But I mean, like here in Florida, you just can go to the seafood market and you can buy all that stuff and put it in a blender and make it yourself. Yeah, it's, you know? it's, it's uh, it, can, <laughs> it could be a lot cheaper to um, just to go into the supermarket, buy some cheap seafood, blend it. Right. And uh, there you go. Um, yeah. Ben's asking, what what's your favorite uh, food vitamin? Um, I like 
I mean, they're all kind of, if you look at the ingredients, they're all mostly the same. There's Celcon, Zocone, Vitacam, probably Vitacam, because I think Vitacam, if you actually look at it, has more, um, like, more vitamins in it. Um, you can actually just do it yourself. I mean, a lot of people actually take a little bit of vitamin C. Like, they'll take, you know, the capsules, and they'll take, like, a little bit of the granules, and they'll move, mix in there. You can do vitamin C. I mean, there, there's all these DIY recipes that you can do. Um, beta glucan is great. Um, you can actually go on Amazon, buy beta glucan, and there's a recipe on my forum to make what we call beta glucan smoothies. And there's been some research done that beta glucan is great, um, especially for putting viruses back into remission. So, you know, getting back to the whole bacterial tufts and viral nodules and all that, I think beta glucan in the food is, is a great answer for that. But it, you just want something easy, cell cone, zocone, vitachem. I think those are all good options. I got to give, uh, I got to, I got to mention this comment by Mike, uh, Lemming, uh, shout out to Dong's do it yourself fish food recipe. I don't know if you know Dong Zo, but I've had him on the show a few times and he has this, uh, um, do it yourself fish food recipe that basically centers on using salmon and, um, okay, and, yeah. and, uh, you know, the fact that it's got, you know, uh, amino acids in it and, and, um, yes. uh, what is it? The omega, um, uh, I'm spacing omega three, omega six. Yeah. And, yeah. and all that stuff. And, 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 um, but yeah, he, uh, he swears by that and he's, you know, the shrimp and scallops, I guess you could throw in there if it makes you feel good. Yeah. White, white fish, uh, is another good thing you can throw into the mix. Um, and then also, you know, fish oil is another good, um, ingredient that you can actually mix in to help boost your fish's immune system. Uh, Hydraspace LLC, hey, uh, is there a particular method you recommend for adding probiotics to foods? Um, so, so here's the thing. It's like, you really need to use a binder for it to, cause like, otherwise it just basically leaches out of the food. You really have to use like a binder. Um, Seachem sells a product called Focus that you can actually use. You can put in the food, which is a binder and also is a, a mild antibacterial. Um, you can also use, un there's a recipe on my forum, um, for unflavored gelatin. You can actually use unflavored uh, gelatin to to as a binder. Um, there's also I interviewed what is his name it was one of the vendors on my forum. So there's actually a, a, a video on my forum from Premier Reefs, which is one of the coral vendors, and he shows you how to do freeze dried food. So how you can basically you can also use like like vitamins and stuff and put it in the freeze dried food. And if you look at this on Humble Fish and Reef YouTube. There is a video I did with Trisha. What is Jeff's business name? What Fish Hotel? I did an interview with Fish Hotel. Fish Hotel's right in the there. chat. Oh, okay. Well, sorry, Jeff. I don't know why I'm blanking <laughs> out right now, and I, I couldn't remember your name. But Fish Hotel actually went to Minneapolis. I uh, he's one of he's one of the, the the best quarantine vendors that we have. I don't know why I blanked out about his name, but he actually showed how he does his food and how he puts vitamins and everything in his food. And that's another way to do it. Um, Ben's wondering about mastic. Mastic is great. That's especially great. Um, you can, you know, for copper bands that don't want to eat, you can sometimes take an empty, um, like a clam shell or, a, a, you know, like a, like a clam shell or something. And you can stick the mastic inside of the shell. And then a lot of times the copper bands We'll start eating that. Sometimes you get mandarins to eat that. I think that's really good food. Andrew Sandler is saying sugar-free liquid children's multivitamin, multivet. Okay. That's what he's using? Uh, that's the <laughs> comment. So I, uh, yeah, that's. You, you can absolutely use human vitamins. I mean, if you can figure out a recipe or a formula that works and you can like, you know, get it into the fish food, there's no reason why you just can't go to GNC and buy your own vitamins and do it yourself. It's the same vitamins. Yeah, it's cheaper. Um, Bobby, you good on time, man? If we go a little. Um, a little yeah, longer? yeah, okay. I'm good. I'm All right. Good. So let's get into uh, gill hyperplasia. So those are basically that's pretty unusual, but that is basically like a. Um, a cluster of cells that will 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 develop in a um, in a fish's gills. I think if you look on my forum, there's like a, a picture of like a clownfish and everything. Um, it is something that you know some things are straightforward, and I can say, well, you know, you have ick treat with copper, but this is one of those things that really not a whole lot you can do about mm -hmm. it. You have to kind of wait to see if it um, if it if it self corrects or not. 
Um, I don't recommend any treatment. I don't recommend, you know, any invasive like surgery on the fish to remove it. I recommend just waiting to see what happens. Okay. With All right. Let's go to one that's um, a very common thing that probably most of us have seen in our tangs, and that is the uh, head and lateral line erosion or HLLE. Yes. So basically what that is, it's literally the fish's skin scales rotting off the fish. And there's all these different theories about what causes it. So I know one study was done that proved that lignite carbon, um, basically like the dust like leaches out and gets into the water column and literally cuts the fish. So I, I recommend only using, um, I recommend only using like really high you know, high grade carbon. I think I always use rock 0 0.8, which I know BRS sells. That's a really good grade of carbon to use so that you don't have to worry about, you know, possibly getting HLLE from carbon. Uh, um, stray voltage is another theory about, um, um, you know, HLLE. So, you know, if you think, you know, if you have fish, you're seeing HLLE, I recommend, you know, you know, testing for stray voltage in the water, just to be sure that's not a possibility. Uh, nutrition can be a cause. Again, we're back to if a fish is it's, it's a vitamin deficiency. Um, fish that go through quarantine, especially tangs that are exposed to copper, um, seem to develop HLLE while in copper. And then when they are removed from the copper quarantine, then it usually clears up. Um, I used to like all the time, um, I would get like good deals from my wholesalers on tangs that had HLLE because I knew they were going to get HLLE in copper anyway. But then it always usually cleared up in like two or three weeks when I put them in observation when the, they were out of uh, copper. So it can be, yeah, it can be stray voltage, vitamin deficiency, copper exposure, or uh, just carbon leaching particles into the water that can cause it. And, and what can you do about it besides uh, usually, if, it's, if it's stray voltage and you find it, but, you know, let's say it's something else? Usually it self-corrects once you remove what's causing okay. it. Um, but it's back to, I've had pretty good success using, actually I've had really good success using, uh, Cellcon and Zocone to reverse it. There's actually like an old, old thread on reef central with this guy he has a purple tank called Hurley. And like this, it looked, the fish looked awful. I mean, it looked like a, like a skeleton or something. And he actually documented over like a one year period where he used Cellcone and Zocone on alternating days and in a year later, the fish looked just magnificent. So with the uh, fin rot, you know, I showed <clears throat> one of the uh, pictures had some, a yellow tang had some serious fin rot. Uh, are you saying that uh, cell cone potentially could uh, regenerate, help, help, help the, uh, the fish regenerate those fins? If the fin rot is being caused by like HLLE, then yes. If the fin rot is being caused by offending pathogenic bacteria, then you would probably need to use antibiotics first. So antibiotics in that situation would kill the offending bacterium, uh, bacteria, and then following, once treatment was successful, then you could use cell cones, o cone, Vitachem to then help the fish's uh, fins heal post-treatment. Yeah, because I have a, a purple tang that um, at one point <clears throat> started having some uh, fin rot, but it stopped. The fish is, uh, it's been like that for a couple of years, two or three years now, and so there's, there's been no more fin rot but it hasn't regenerated. Right. So I would definitely try the vitamins. I would definitely try cell cones, o cone, Vitachem, start adding that to the food. Um, the good thing about using those is even if it like le like you soak it in the food, but it leaches out into the water, it's not going to harm anything. Um, in fact, there's some products out there. I think you actually can dose vitamin C directly into the water column. The fish will absorb it. They'll drink the medicated water, and it'll help them that way. Yeah, because I've used um, Vitacam in in mm -hmm. uh, in my do-it-yourself fish and coral food. Yes, yeah, it's great stuff. Yeah. Really good stuff. Uh, Reef Exotica by Luis Aceves. Thank you, man, for that uh, very uh, generous super chat. Bobby's thoughts, and let me also thank Kevin Stewart for that super chat. Thanks, guys, as a comment. But um, so Lu Luis is asking Bobby's thoughts on the. BRS slash marine collector's method of QTing. 100% water change with salt water, meds, copper, nitro at the therapeutic levels every three days, dosing four times. Did this, got velvet wiped out. So I, 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 it, okay. I, so I kind of understand it, but I, I'll just be, I disagree with it because so basically it sounds like what, what they're doing is, and I don't remember the exact details, but basically 
They're doing like 100% water changes on the quarantine tank. And then they're, they're wiping out the quarantine tank, refilling it, putting the fish back in. But my problem with that is we're back to tomones. So if a fish has ichor velvet, for instance, um, uh, and the, the parasites fall off the fish, the protomons crawl around, they look for a, um, um, a hard surface to insist upon to, to, to form the, the, the tomone, the cyst stage, which then releases free swimmers, can you know, reinfect your fish. Um, I, pro, tomones are hard to kill. Um, in one study, it took 60 ppm chlorine 24 hours to kill yeah. them. So my concern with that method is that even if you drain the water and all that, and even if you wipe the tank down, you still could have um, tomones on the glass, on your pumps, any hard surface, right? Um, so I just don't really think it's a good idea. I think a better idea, if you're, if you're going to do all that anyway, if you're going to go through the work of doing 100% water changes, I would advise doing tank transfer method instead mm -hmm. because you're basically doing the same thing except – so, like, when I did tank transfer method, I used two 10-gallon tanks. I had, like, a, um, a an air bubbler. I think I had, a, like, an air stone in there. I had some, you know, PVC elbows for hiding spaces. And basically what I would do is I would just then move the fish to a different tank, a whole new tank. So you're leaving any disease problems behind in the old tank. And then I would take the 10-gallon tank and all the equipment outside, clean it all with bleach or vinegar really quickly, rinse it out, let it dry for 72 hours, and reuse it. And I just feel that's a better way of sterilizing a quarantine tank for reuse than doing 100% water change. So I'm not real keen on their <coughs> method. Fair enough. Um, Mike Campbell is asking, can Bobby talk about certain medicines becoming toxic when used with UV and QT? Some think they are setting up the ultimate QT and they end up killing the fish because they don't know. So copper sulfate, which most people don't use anymore, can become, if it's exposed to UV light, um, can become more toxic. Cupramine, which is ionic copper, um, it breaks the chemical bond and can turn the copper more toxic. There have been studies done on um, uh, chelated copper, which is copper power, copper safe. It does not break the chemical bond, so you actually can run a UV with chelated copper, um, which is copper power, copper safe. Don't ever use it with cupramine. Um, I would not use a UV with any other medications because most likely it would degrade it from the water. It would not cause any, like, it wouldn't cause anything harmful. But, like, if you're dosing antibiotics or you're dosing Prozipro or metronidazole or formalin, it will actually strip it out of the water and render the treatment, like, useless. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, all right, man. Uh, moving on. Let's talk about internal problems. And let's start with the uh, swim bladder disorder. So this is normally encountered with fish that are collected in deep water. Um, I'm trying to think, like rat, some wrasses are a really, really good example. Um, they're collected in deep water. We, we all know that at the collection site, they don't usually take the time needed to properly decompress the fish before they bring them to the surface of the water. So what happens sometimes is either a gas bubble will form in the fish's swim bladder or sometimes the swim bladder gets infected. Um, if it's a gas bubble, there's actually a video on my forum that someone did where you can actually like take a um, like a hypodermic needle and you can lance the air out, um, you know, which is not for everyone, but you can do that. Swim bladder infections can be treated by um, food soaking antibiotics, um, but they can be hit or miss as to whether they're they're treated successfully. Um, that's usually the cause of, cause of swim bladder disorders. It's usually when a when a deep water fish is collected and not properly decompressed before being sold. And sometimes the bubbles, they start really small in the gas in the gas bubbles in the swim bladder. You may not see them for weeks or months until a after the fish is collected. So the fish may look perfectly fine um, when, when the, you buy the fish, and then a week or so later, the fish you'll see like a protrusion developing in this fish's uh, swim bladder area. Right. And if you're going to be using a needle to uh, to try to like degas that swim bladder or whatever you're doing with it, you gotta you gotta sterilize that thing. You gotta know what you're doing, right? Yes. Well, you know what? There's a there's a, again on my forum a guy. He did like a video, and you know he he had like a black cat basslet that developed you know this, and um, he did it. He he documented it. He got so good at it that a local fish store nearby was like uh, 
you know, having them come in every week to, to do it to their fish. And you know, he was, he was lancing the air out of, uh, the gas bubbles in their fish. So I guess it's like anything else. Practice makes perfect. If you do it enough times, you get comfortable with it and you know, you become a fish surgeon. Fish hotel <laughs> says, uh, I see it all the time in blotched, uh, blotched antheus. Yeah. The, um, the, the, the I remember, um, when, the, when those fish first came out, you kind of like, uh, a lot of them were, um, kind of swimming funny. And it was swim bladder yeah. issues because they're collected from very deep uh, in the ocean, right? Yeah. And there, what happens is a lot of times a fish has a gas bubble in the swim bladder that it'll, it'll swim tail up because right. the, 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 the bubble is pulling it up. It, it, it's swimming like vertically with the tail up because it, the buoyancy is off. And shouldn't the, um, <clears throat> I mean, shouldn't the collectors be, does, does that not manifest itself until later down the, the line in terms of the, uh, the people, you know, out there that are collecting and, or the wholesalers does, is that so, something that will, uh, maybe not, you might, might not see until it kind of gets into the, uh, retail en environment there. It depends. I've seen videos where, where the collectors like the divers are actually out there collecting these fish, bringing them up to the surface and they're the lancing that we're talking about. They're doing that right there in the boat. Mm because sometimes the, the gas bubble develops really quickly, so they're having to lance that air right out in the boat. Well, then after the fish looks normal, even though sometimes the gas bubble comes black back, they will um, um, you know, then ship the fish to the wholesaler, wholesaler ships to the retailer, retailer sells to the customer. Sometimes the gas bubble will develop um, when the fish is in, uh, under the care of the wholesaler, retailer, or sometimes you don't see it uh, until it makes its way to the customer. Yeah. And you know how it works in this industry. You move the fish, you move the livestock down the supply chain. The goal is to get the livestock, you know, the customer to buy it. And then it's their problem, yeah. whatever happens yeah. to it, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, yep. Um, internal bacterial infections. So the best way to treat those, those are basically like, so a <laughs> marine biologist once told me everything that you see that can go wrong on the outside of a fish can also go wrong on the inside of a mm. fish. So this is a case where bacterial infections are ha ha occurring internally. It could be, you know, a, a, an internal organ is infected. It could be the inside of the fish's skin is infected. Um, the, there's two ways of treating this. Food soaking antibiotics is probably the optimal way. Um, you can also put a fish in a quarantine tank and dose antibiotics um, because the fish will drink the medicated water. It will pass through their system. Um, a good antibiotic for treating internal infections is actually canamycin um, because it's readily absorbed by a fish's skin and it's readily absorbed, you know, by their in internally when they drink the water. So that's the best way to treat internal infections. But internal infections are hard to diagnose because you don't really see yeah. any symptoms except maybe some bloating that's not in the swim bladder area when the infection becomes enlarged. Um, Captive Aquatic Ecosystems, Ben, thank you very much, man, for that super chat. The comments, good info, worth something for sure. Um, internal worms and parasites. So a fish can get, um, in, just like a dog or cat, can get intestinal worms um, inside of their, their GI tract. Um, and the symptoms for that is usually... You know, if you've got a fish that, that, that's eating like crazy but just keeps getting skinnier and skinnier, that is a symptom of, in, of intestinal worms. Sometimes the intestinal worms will produce uh, white stringy feces or sometimes mm -hmm. the stomach will look pinched. Um, the challenging thing is um, it's less common, but sometimes fish can also get internal flagellates, internal parasites, which produce the same exact symptoms. Um, I tell most people the best treatment for that is um, it's two products. Fritz makes a product called Paracleanse. API makes a product called General Cure. It's a mixture of Prosequantol and Metronidazole. And if you food soak those and those medications pass through the GI tract, it will usually kill both of those pathogens. Unfortunately, there is, I forget which, there is one type of internal intestinal worm that Prosequantol does not treat. And that's when you have to resort to Fenbendazole, which is another dewormer that you can either... So, uh, you can dose in the water or you can food soak and send benders all is probably the best dewormer because it, uh, it kills the three main types of intestinal worms where Prosequantol only treats two. Is there any, uh, risk of food soaked medications leaching back or working their way back into the reef, uh, ecosystem? 
Yes. Because if you're not using a binder, like you're not using like focus is the one that's just commercially available. Um, or you're not using like, um, unflavored gelatin, or you're not using a binder to bind that medication to the food, then the, it basically can leach out into the water column. Uh, fenbenderzole, for example, I never, I tell people do never, don't ever use fenbenderzole in our, in a, um, in a reef tank, especially with soft corals. It is just terrible for killing soft corals in LPS. Um, so that, that is, so a risk. you need to use a binder when you're doing this, uh, food soaked, uh, medication. Especially in a, if you're going to do it in a DT, less of a concern if you're doing it in quarantine because, you know, there's no corals or anything to worry about killing or inverts. But if you're going to food soak any medications in a reef environment, it's really important to use a binder to bind that food um, to, the, to the, the medication to the food. Gotcha. Um, spinal injuries. How does that happen? So this normally... So this can happen a number of ways. Um, it's most often seen in wrasses. You know, we all know how wrasses like to jump. Um, mm -hmm. I've had it happen a lot where, like, in my quarantine room, I would have wrasses, like, usually fairy or flash of wrasses. Usually, usually it's mostly fairy wrasses. They jump. They hit the lid. Uh, they hit something. They damage their, their, um, their spinal cord, and they usually don't survive. I've also seen evidence that uranema, you know, we talked about how uranema can spread internally. Your anema can actually feed um, on a fish's spinal cord, mm. damage it, make it brittle, and then you've got a spinal cord injuries. Um, spinal cord injuries are almost 100% fatal. It is very unusual for a fish to ever recover from a, from a spinal injury because usually the spinal column is so damaged that the fish is just screwed. That, that's a shame. I mean, in that yeah. case, what are you trying to do? You're trying to get the fish out of there and, and um, make uh... – so it's not going to suffer and try to just, uh, what, do you, what, do you rec what yeah. do you recommend for a fish that's just too far gone or not going to have any chance of survival? Pull it, pull it out. Um, you, you can try some treatments, some treatments on the form. I think one of the things that I suggest you can try methylene blue, like a methylene blue bath or put it in a QT. You don't have a QT, at least put the, usually it's a rasp, put it like in an acclimation box. So it's not just getting blown all over the tank. As long as the fish continues to eat, you know, which they sometimes can still do with spinal injuries. I don't recommend use euthanasia. Once the fish stops eating, usually then I recommend just use clove oil and, and euthanize the yeah, fish. Okay. For its own good. Um, lymphocytis. That's so that's a, a virus. So lymphocytis lives inside of a fish. It's a virus that, that a lot of fish actually have, and most of the time it's dormant. Um, when there is a flare up that is when you will see the white cauliflower growths that are on a fish's spines and yeah. fins. Sometimes it can be on the body. Um, best treatment is to use um, vitamins, beta-glucan, uh, probiotics to enhance the fish's immune system to put the virus back into remission. It Again, it's a really crude comparison, but I like to use human herpes. It's the same thing. Herpes lives inside you. You can't ever get rid of it. You know, anybody has got a mouth, you know, mouth sores, you know, you know, the, it has, has HPV one, you can't get rid of it. All you can do is when you have a flare up, you can do things to boost your immune system, to put the virus back into remission until the next time. And lymphocytes, this is the exact same way. Chris, ACI aquaculture is in the house. What's happening there, Chris? Um, all right, let's, uh, let's get into something that uh, everybody knows about, which is Marine Ick. So marine ick is um, caused by a parasite, um, and, and ick has, has a life stage where um, when it's on the fish, it's called the, the trophonts. They drop off. They become protomonts. They, we talked about before, it becomes the tomont stage, which insists to any hard surface, and then the, which is sort of like the egg stage, it then releases free swimmers into the water, which are called therons, which reinfect the fish. Normally, if a fish has ick, um, the white spots, and this is kind of a way to tell to, to uh, it different from velvet. Uh, ick trophons are usually like larger. They're usually more the size of like like a grain of salt. Um, they're usually, if you look really really closely, they're oval shaped, mm -hmm. and they're usually not. Normally, if a fish has ick, it's not. Especially if you're, it's in a system in a healthy system. Especially if you're using the UV sterilizer. Especially if you're doing all these things. Uh, usually, a fish with ick is not covered in white dots. You might just see a few white dots here and there, you know, and the ick is a, a parasite that a lot of people just manage. 
by using the UV or ozone and doing proper nutrition. It's a, I feel it's a mild parasite, which can be managed um, in, in a DT. It's not like velvet, where marine velvet disease is like these little sprinkles of salt, I'm sorry, little sprinkles of sugar, or sometimes a dusting all over the fish, which just, there's so many parasites on the fish that it usually kills them and it's very difficult to manage. Um, what about raising the temperature in the tank to fight ick? Um, that is something that's done for freshwater ick, but that's actually going to make things worse with saltwater ick because what that does is when you increase water temperature, um, it speeds up the life cycle. So the fish are going to be inundated with more and more parasites more frequently. Increasing the water temperature is good to do in a fallow system. In fact, there was one study that showed that if you could raise the water temperature to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, you could rid a, a tank of a fallow tank of it in just two weeks. But if fish are present in the water, raising water temperature is the wrong thing to do because the fish is just going to be inundated with more parasites. And in water, warmer water, there's less dissolved oxygen. And then a lot of times it will get into a fish's gills. So you're actually kind of doing a fish a disservice because it's just making it more difficult for the fish to fight it off. Gotcha. All right. So you mentioned velvet. This is uh, this is something that uh, is a little bit more complicated for sure, right? That's not it's velvet's not something you really want to get into your system. No. So velvet is technically a dinoflagellate, um, mm. and there's some controversy about whether or not it can use light as energy. In addition to fish, there's, you know, whether it's that type of a dinoflagellate, but basically has a very similar life cycle to ick. It, you know, goes through the whole on the fish, off the fish, reinfected. Um, it, it's, it's usually like the white dots are a lot smaller, a lot more numerous. Sometimes it's just like a dusting on the fish. Um, and the particular thing about velvet, velvet seems to infect the gills first and foremost. So a lot of times, you will not see any visible physical symptoms on the fish whatsoever. The fish just starts breathing heavy and dies. That usually means that um, the velvet, uh, they call them dinospores, the free swimmers, have infected the fish's gills. When, when the, the dinospores infect the gills, excess mucus starts to form. That's the fish's immune response. And basically the fish is, is suffocated to death. And the only way you can tell in that instance if that's what killed your fish is you have to take some po post-mortem, you take some gill clippings, Look at them under a microscope and you'll see the, the parasites under a microscope. But velvet is very difficult to manage. It's, it's, it's probably the number one tank killer in our hobby. Um, some people will get marine velvet disease and they'll lose their entire fish population in a few days, a week. Yeah, I could see a few folks. Corey Page said, lived it and hoped never again. Um, velvet sucks. Yep. Um, yeah. Yep. Reef Keeper, F Velvet, been wiped out twice. Um, yeah. Chris at ACI velvet killed my king guy angelfish. Oof. Ouch. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so it, it very manageable. A lot of people just manage it. You get velvet. That's a whole different ball game in your DT. Very difficult disease to manage in your, in your display um, tank. And if you do proper QT is, uh, is that pretty much a, uh, you, you can't say it's bulletproof, but is, is it going to really increase your odds that you're not going to introduce velvet if you're doing the, uh, you know, QT protocol that you uh, talk about? Yeah, but you have to QT everything. So, I mean, um, like the good thing about velvet is um, it's you can easily kill it with copper. So, you know, if you're just running a fish, you know, most, a lot of people like to use copper. If you're treating with copper for, for 30 days, you're, you're very unlikely to get, you know, the fish is probably going to be clean of velvet. Um, but then I stress, if you want to keep velvet out, you have to quarantine everything. Because just like ick, velvet can, the free swimmers, I'm sorry, the 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 protomonts can drop off and can insist on hard surfaces just like it can and you can actually introduce velvet into your dt with unquarantined snails holy corals. crap really yeah wow there are two so there's Man. two there's Jeez, two big diseases fair, you have to worry Bobby. about <laughs> i know i don't you know i kind of feel like all i do is give people bad news sometimes but i'm like look i don't I don't make the rules. I just read this stuff, you know, these peer reviewed articles and they tell me how it works. And I just try to <laughs> extrapolate from that and share the information that I learned. Dude, the, the whole thing about snails is really bummed me out. Cause now I'm like, you got me really very nervous about adding any more snails to my systems because geez, go to, go to inverted reef. They sell inverted reef. Uh, okay. quarantine cleanup crew, snails, whatever you need that. 
They actually that's just, huge. Just started a few months that's ago. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a game changer. A lot of people don't understand. They they quarantine all their fish and everything's going along fine. Then they order a cleanup crew cool order, and next thing you know, everything's dying. They're like, "How did this happen?" I'm like, "Well, it probably came in on a snail shell." Yeah, that uh, that's that's probably what happened to me in terms of uh, some past diseases that uh, got introduced somehow. But yeah, all right, man, eye opening. Yeah. So, um, all right, a couple more there, Bobby, and then uh, then we can let you go. Tang fingerprint disease. What is that? what is that? So that's kind of like a. Um, it's weird. Like it only it's only on surgeon fish. It kind of looks like a like a splotch, almost like a discoloration. It's sometimes on both sides of the of the tang, and it's usually identical. Nobody knows what really causes it. Hmm. Um, in most cases, it maybe it's a bacterial thing. I'm not entirely sure. Um, it usually just goes away. It's usually one of those things that just sort of self corrects. It, 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 you know, it freaks you out a little bit, but then two or three days later, it's completely gone and you never see it again. Okay. Gotcha. And, um, the last one, I'm going to butcher this name, uh, trichodenia. Is that, uh, mm. is that correct? Trich yeah. Trichodina. trichodina. So that is a, that is a parasite. Um, if you look at it under, a, um, uh, under a microscope, it looks like a little flying saucer. Yep, I'm showing that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those parasites that it, you know what it's, it's another one of those parasites that a lot of tanks have it. It's usually most fish can manage it via their natural immune system. Um, but the good news with trichodina is if you treat with copper, it kills it instantly actually. Um, so if you just do a copper QT and I suspect even like chloroquine, formalin, hydrogen peroxide, it's a pretty, it's pretty easy to kill it. Um, so it's one of those more incidental parasites that you could get if you didn't quarantine. Um, Chris from ACI says, uh, we rinse our snails in RO multiple times. Not sure if it helps with this, but I guess it, it uh, makes them feel better. Um, right. Well, the problem is the tomones. The tomones that actually insist to the shells, uh, they're very, very difficult um, to remove. I mean, they don't, I mean, they, they, really, they really adhere very, you know, to the shells, to any hard surface. You really, I mean, I know some people... <laughs> take like a toothbrush and try to, you know, like, you know, toothbrush the, the, the snail shell. I don't know if that works or not. Um, Probably not because, uh, you know, the way this uh, <laughs> world works in terms of um, bad stuff, they always find yeah. a way, right? They find a way. Life, life finds yeah. a way. Yeah. Life, good and bad. It always finds a yeah. way. But, you know, I guess what we can uh, do here is, is, is to, uh, you know, follow these uh, procedures and, and um, you know, steps that you have outlined and, and it's going to decrease the odds of the bad stuff yes. getting in. So that's yeah. that's what's important. So Bobby, man, I've I've learned uh, I've learned a number of new things tonight, and uh, one is that I'm going to be very cautious about adding any more uh, green chromas to my display tanks or frag tanks or whatever, as well as the uh, the whole uh, snail thing. Blows my mind, dude. Yes, I don't know. Yeah, just just uh, you know, you, you set up a fr uh, if you have a fishless frag tank, if you get a cleanup crew, uh, just put them in there for. I mean, you know, look, if you just do thirty days, that's that that probably is long enough. I recommend six weeks to be extra safe. The whole problem with quarantining cleanup crew is they run out of algae, so you're going to have to constantly be supplemental feeding those nori, those little algae wafers or whatever to get them to eat. Otherwise, they 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 starve to death. But I mean, it can be done. You know, a lot of people do it. Yeah. Um, so it all comes down to your tolerance for risk. Yep. That's what it comes down to. What is your tolerance for risk? You know? Yep. All right, man. So uh, any any final words before we sign off? Uh, just, you know, like the the, the, the form is humble.fish. And if you have any um, any questions or, or whatever, like you have any fish disease problems or whatever, you can go on there. You can, uh, you can post a, a thread. You can post pictures. Either myself or one of the, we have what we call fish disease medics, fish disease experts. Uh, we'll we'll chime in and help you as best we can to solve your um, your your disease problem. Um, also, I encourage people please to support our vendors. I don't make any money off our vendors. Our vendors don't pay me. Our vendors are there because I trust them that they're doing they're doing a good job and they're trying to be one of the good actors in this hobby. I I don't make any money off the vendors at all. 
please support so please support them and also humble.fish is not just um, a place for fish diseases we're actually like a like a you know all around reform so if you have any questions about your aquarium if you have you know reef chemistry questions or like are you want to show off your aquarium or whatever you want to do come on the forum and, and join the community and you know be, be a part of our community well, Bobby, listen, I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody that's been uh, tuning in. Appreciate what you guys uh, do for the uh, for the hobby. A great resource. And folks, if you haven't checked out Humble.Fish, um, please do so. You will um, most likely learn a lot and and uh, better your reef keeping skills. Yes. So That's the goal. Yeah. So, all right, Bobby. Well, listen, man, thank you so much for, uh, for being on the show. Appreciate you taking the time. I also want to... Thank um, the sponsors, both Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine, for supporting the show. And also want to thank all you folks out there that tuned in. Also a big thank you to Paul, who is the moderator, as well as the president of the Boston Reefer Society. Please join and support your local reefing clubs. They are so important to this hobby. Also want to let you know that all episodes of Wrap Around the Reef Foam are available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Amazon. My next Wrapping with Reef Bum live stream will be on Tuesday, January 23rd at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. My guest will be Allie from Amazing Aquariums and Reefs. So you can check out the full upcoming schedule of guests on reefbum.com under the YouTube section for future episodes. Until then, be safe and be well. Later. Good night, everyone. <laughs>